uh, yeah, so there was one time where my mom was sleeping and suddenly someone called my mom. The woman was like, why are you sleeping with my husband? Don't you know that I have his child right now? It's Jean Zanker here, and today we've got TikTok star Kevin with us. You may know him better as Cadences. Welcome! Hi, that's so weird to call me a TikTok star. What should I, I call you? Uh? Should I, call I don't know, you I'm like... not very... I don't like that label. You don't like not. that label? I don't know, it just makes me feel very like... I don't know. Okay, yeah. we'll have to think of something else for you by what, the end TikTok of the show. TikTok personality. TikTok personality. personality. Yeah. You do have a lot of personality. Because all stars are dead. Oh! Right now, I'm going to introduce our psychotherapist. Her name is Melissa. So Melissa's here and she's going to provide some mental health insights uh, throughout the episode as well. So welcome, Melissa. Thank you, Jean. I'm honoured to be here. Hi, Melissa. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hi, I Kevin. feel like you get to know me a lot after today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think we're going we're gonna to have a lot, of, a lot of things to talk about here yeah. today. Um, first things first, Kevin, I think you're absolutely hilarious on TikTok. I love your videos. Thank you. You are relatable, you're funny, you are uh, open and vulnerable. Can you tell us about your journey to become a content creator? How, how was that like? I think I've always like been creating content even since before TikTok. I actually have a private YouTube account where I created videos just for like my group of friends last time. Yeah. And it was always, it's always been like a passion and hobby for me because I think growing up, um, I just didn't really have that outlet to express my creativity. So I turned to like content creation a lot. Like I would like be sitting in my, on my table, I'd be like, oh, what if I have a skit where I get angry at my dentist because she prolongs the appointment too long. That kind of, <laughs> I'll just make a video about it. I'll share with my friends. And then um, it just so happened that like, one of those videos that I made because I used we used to have like some teachers that we didn't like and I'll make videos about them <laughs> so did they see it? did the yeah, teachers see it? so during graduation they actually one of the teachers like one of the, the headmaster saw it yeah and he came up to me and he actually told me that he found it funny oh good oh wow what an encouragement that's yeah. pretty cool so right? so I was like oh actually more people find like what I find funny funny you're so out there with your content. I, I absolutely love it. How do you oh, yeah. get this like confidence? Because I think like not everybody who is in your age group has this sort of like, you know? What happened was back in when I was 18 or 17, like my life has been on like a down downhill spiral ever since like because it, it started from young, right? Then it downhill spiral all the way till I was 18. And I've been in, in and out of IMH a few times because it got really bad. And there was a point in time where I was incredibly suicidal and I really wanted to end my life really badly because every aspect of my life was going wrong. I was losing friends. I was uh, I was losing like almost everything. And you know how like sometimes when you have like depression or anxiety, they it, it makes a situation seem worse than it really is. So I... I got to a point where I felt like killing myself and it was so bad to the point that I hit like the lowest I've ever been in my life and somehow something switched on in me and I was like, I've lived my entire life fearing things and this is where I am now. What if I just give myself one year where I just try everything? I just give in to every intrusive thought in a good way. Like if I want to pursue something, I just pursue it. I don't think about what if I feel because I'm really at rock bottom. How much lower can I go, right? So I just gave myself that one year freedom to just explore everything I wanted to do, try everything I want, just create this new identity and embody it. Even though like, you know, fake it till you make it. So I just created this identity like, okay, I'm confident, I'm strong, I'm this, I'm that. I'm, like basically just changed like the perception of myself, like which is where the self-concept aspect came in. So I just told myself that I am this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. And I just embodied that no matter how much I didn't believe it for like one year. And then my life just changed. Wow. Yeah. How long ago was that? Um, 2019. Wow, recent. 2019, okay. 2018. Because up to then, my confidence was like terrible. And then I, I just spiraled a lot. And my anxiety was like an all-time high. Can you tell us a bit about this self-concept thing that you're referring to? Oh, yeah. So self-concept is about how you perceive yourself. And I don't know whether you heard this term. It's like in the spiritual community, law, law of manifestation, everything. Um, everyone around you is you pushed out. I Have you heard of that before as a... The therapy. manifestation I have. Yeah, like I everyone have. around you is you pushed out. So if I show up to an occasion thinking that everyone hates me and that I'm um that w that will manifest. Like uh I I always go into a relationship thinking that I will attract cheaters, then I will attract cheaters. But it's about your self concept. So if I believe that I'm someone that is worthy of love, then I would choose actions that will um in a way like confirm that that I'm worthy of love. But if I wake up every day telling myself that life is shit, I'm a terrible person. I'm lazy, I'm this, I'm this, I'm that. Then I will accept 
situations and people that will con continue to affirm that. Yeah, so self-concept is in a way like um, how you view yourself and what do you and do you not tolerate as a person. And that's where like boundaries will come into, which is very important for me because as someone that grew up in like a family that was very destructive, I think boundaries was something that I had to learn very later on in life. Yeah, because it was like, a, if you don't do this, then it will happen. So I felt the need to always like do something out of my comfort zone to ensure it doesn't happen. Kevin, when I hear you speak, it's almost like you're sharing how you changed your life from the inside out. Yeah. Because through all the circumstances that you've been through in your life, it, it kind of, it's almost like it creates a set of lens from which you see the world yeah. from a really young age. Like mm. whether it's your belief about yourself, whether it's belief about how others will treat you. Yeah. And then that's why, you know, it caused you to, to struggle with a lot of like moods and a mm. lot of difficulties in your yeah. self-concept. But then you decided to change that. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, you're saying like, it's, it's a year and then you really kind of yeah. just changed it. But I want people to know that it's really very difficult it to is. make that decision it because is. you're making it every day. Every morning you wake up, the, the default like parts of your brain would would kick in. Yeah. But then every day you got to remind yourself that, hey, you know, now that I have the chance to make something of myself, I want to live this life that I yes. want to live. And, and when you share, you know, how confidently you manifest it, because the emotions that you experience, if you feel confident, then you're going to portray right. confidence. And when people see how confident you are, they react differently to yeah, you. Right? Definitely. And that's like a positive reciprocal feedback yeah. loop. And uh, I'm really happy. That's worked really well for you. So my childhood was, I would say, very destructive, but I've never really acknowledged it as destructive. I thought it was normal until like my little part in my life. So my dad is an avoidant, a terrible, terrible avoidant. Like he really avoids his issues. And the way he deals with his issues is through violence. Okay, so basically my, grand, my, my father was a compulsive liar and cheater. So he cheated and then he gambled all, my, all the money away. So we were like financially broke for a period of time. But my mom hid it from us. And we were so broke that he gambled the money away and he had to forge, signature, forge my mom's signature to get money from her. Then she had to pay off the debts. But he was still broke. So he took my... my you know, uh, for our first baby shower, they always give like jewelry and everything. He took all of mine and sold it away to pay his debts. And still he, yeah, he was still bankrupt. Then he lost his job. And uh, he cheated on my mom. He would always say he's on business trips, but he would, uh, yeah. So there was one time where my mom was sleeping with next to him and suddenly someone called my mom. And when they picked up, when my mom picked up the phone, the woman was like, why are you sleeping with my husband? Don't you know that I have his child right now? Oh my God. Yeah, so apparently my, my, my dad slept with another woman outside and got her pregnant. Yeah, and the thing is, I used to sleep in between my parents. So I heard every bicker and argument because I think we didn't have a room for myself. My brother slept with my grandma and my grandpa slept alone. So I would always hear these bickers and arguments and everything. Prior to me being, um, being born, my mom got this call and she wanted to end her life. Yeah, so she wanted to end her life and she wanted to jump off a building. And she didn't even know I was, she was conceived with me. She only knew because one day she's a, she's a teacher. So when she was climbing the stairs and she felt very lethargic. So she went to check and she realized she was pregnant. And she at that point didn't want to keep me because the marriage was on the rocks. And it was terrible. Like it was really terrible. And my, my dad was like abusive and everything. Then um, my mom just tolerated it because she wanted both my brother and I to grow up with a father figure. But this father figure was very destructive. And I think the part that blew the the part that blew the cat how did it the the part that blew, blew the, the lid, lid off, off the cat yeah. yeah, okay. You get what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So what happened was um there was a night where the argument got really bad and I was studying in the living room. And because last time I um no one in my in my family spoke English other than my mother and father. So no one they were arguing, so they can't test me the spelling. The next day I had spelling. So I recorded me in my walker. Walker man, that one, that thingy. And I recorded myself giving myself spelling. And then I plugged in the earpiece. Then I gave myself spelling. Then throughout the entire thing, I could hear them like shouting. And it was like really bad. The, the doors were closed. So my grandma, she would always send me to stop them because she had this thinking that 
if the youngest child went to stop them, they would stop, like out of pity or something. So that night she sent me to stop them again. And then I would knock on the door and they, they didn't respond. So I just opened the door. And when I opened the door, I saw a hanger flying past. Like my dad was like throwing hangers at my mom. Then she was like at the wall and everything. And then I like, I saw that I was like, oh my God. So um, immediately I was like, I have to stop this. So I kicked my dad's leg, but that didn't stop. So after that, my mom went into the closet and started crying. Then my, my dad was shouting like, why are you crying to get pity from me? You're not going to get pity from me, that kind of thing. Then after that, my mom got up and then she was like still fighting my dad, right? And then after that, um, he went to smash the toilet door. Like it broke into half. And to me, that was like normal because this happened a lot. But I just knew in my heart like, okay, this is a notch above the usual. Then after that, um, my grandma came to beg them to stop. Because I think she also knew that this was like one of the worst arguments mm. they had. And then when it happened, she came with a glass, I think, and one of them, either my dad or my mom threw the glass on the floor. No, either my dad or my grandma threw the glass on the floor and they broke into shards. Then after that, my dad turned to my mom and was like, why are you using my mother to gain pity for me? Yeah, so they started even fighting even more and more and more. And then my grandma, I do not know why she said this, but she was like, if you guys continue fighting, I will hug me and my brother and jump off the car park. Either that or I put detergent in their milk and kill them or like something like that. I'll drink. I don't know why I was drinking milk at eight years old, by the way, but I was still drinking milk at eight years old, like per. But then like she was like, I will put like, I will put like detergent in their milk and kill them and everything. Or like I will hug them and jump off the car park and kill them. Yeah, so my mom was like, okay, yeah, this is um too much. It was a Wednesday because I remember the next day at school. Then after that, uh, we just caught we just knew that like it was very unsafe because my mom, um, at that point, she was staying for my father. But at that point, because my grandma had threatened to kill my brother and I, she thought it was too much. So she asked me to pack my stuff and she asked my brother to pack my stuff. And I was like happily packing all the clothes and everything. She was like, Kevin, just pack the damn passport, <laughs> your IC and go. Don't pack your clothes and then take our school stuff and just go. So I just packed everything. Then we had to take the staircase down because we lived on the eighth floor. We were afraid that if we would take the lift, we would bump into my grandpa. So he, uh, my grandpa's harmless, but we just didn't want to go through that because we really went through a lot. So we went down the staircase, like my brother and I, and my mom. Then after that, we took a cab all the way to my maternal side, and my maternal. Uh, and from then on, me, my mom, and my brother shared the same room for like from two thousand and eight all the way up till two thousand and twelve. So that's like four years. Wow. Yeah. So we shared the same room for four years, four to five years, and um. It's not really funny, but like it's just comical because opposite our room is my cousin who's also living there because they broke up with like she divorced. So like it was just like then when our moms were out working, we would just like cross rooms. Then we would play with each other and everything. But that was kind of cute. But the story behind it is not cute. <laughs> right. It's like a household um, like broken relationships has caused everybody yeah. to come, come and stay together. Yeah. Right? And we had to stay in the same room for four years. It was a bit of like at that point, I just kind of I don't know how I got through it, but I did. And it didn't really process in my head as something terribly bad. Only up to recently when I started listening to other people's like families and everything, then I was like, oh shit. like this is bad. Wow, Kevin, that's a lot, man. That that is uh, <laughs> I need I need a moment to digest that. Um yeah, that was that was intense. It pains me. It pains me. And then also you're, you're also talking about it very candidly you know, at the same time. So it makes me feel like I, I, I want to give you a hug. And then at the same time, I feel like, no. <laughs> you know, like you're... No, it's, you're sort um, of, yeah. I feel like I've not... I, I feel like I've processed the situations, but the traumas they left behind, like my abandonment issues, my anxious attachment stuff, that is what I have to deal with now. I don't have to deal with the memories of that because I've already overcome it. Yeah. yeah. It's more of like what, what you did to that child the trauma it left behind so i'm dealing with that right now and i think that's more important of course to deal with yeah. in my life right now because the memories itself i i okay they're there whatever but i think it's how these traumas are affecting my life right now that i'm more concerned about yeah yeah hey can i ask how 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 is your family now i mean it's like how's your mom after my dad left my mom or actually my mom left my dad it's very important like which who say that my mom left my dad and they divorced and everything um i felt that my family didn't have a father figure. And for some reason, I felt like this responsibility to take over and ensure that everything was okay. And I think I did it very subconsciously. I wasn't doing this consciously that, okay, I want to be the breadwinner of the family and everything. So there came a point where I shut off my emotions and I refused to be vulnerable around my family. Yeah, it just, 
didn't sit right with me. I just can't be vulnerable around my family. I can't cry in front of my family. I can't, I can't um, express how I feel towards them because I feel that that will give the illusion that not everything is not okay with me. And my friend um, described this term like hyper masculinity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something. So basically, I always feel the need to like take care of a situation and do things to fix the situation. But whenever I need to take a back seat to allow things to happen, like I'm not comfortable with that. And this has seeped into other areas in my life. I mean, in terms of career, it's fantastic because I'm very proactive. I, I, I can bump up emails. I can do this. Are we still doing this? Like, you know, very, very proactive in my career. But in terms of my relationship, it creates very one-sided relationships because I'm always the one that initiates. And that never gives room for people to initiate. Mm. And I never realized that it's tied to this reason. Because of my dad leaving, I felt like the need to step up to be that masculine figure in my family. Kevin, you know, that hyper masculinity that you were sharing, it's, it's almost like it was a way for you to survive, right? Definitely. It was a way for you to survive the environment that was not only physically unsafe, but emotionally, yeah. it was really, really unsafe. Witnessing all those violence, you know, being put in a place where the attachment figures that were supposed to take care of you when you were a dependent, like, did not take that role. So yeah. in that environment, showing emotions was actually threatening. So it, growing up like that, it's, it's almost like to survive, you learn to just press it all down and yeah. sort of put up this, this guard, so to speak, so that, you know, you won't be hurt, rejected, abandoned again. And up to now, I still have not been fully comfortable with being like taken care of or like being vulnerable. And there's only like a handful of people that I can feel like completely vulnerable around. And even up to then, I still have this like thinking in my head that, oh shit, if one day they leave me, then that's it. Like they would have all my secrets and everything. So I'm always very closed off to like opening up to new people and I struggle to do it a lot. I feel like he has so much more to grow though. Like as in yeah, like, you definitely. know, yeah. I mean, you're very young and you've kind of, I think he's actually figured out quite a lot of things yes, already in this yeah. short space of time. So, you know, well done, man. I think Kevin, yeah, you've, uh, you've come quite a long way. Yeah. Yeah, I think you have. <laughs> you have, you have. Um, can we talk a little bit about um, your where you, where you hope to take your content creation to? Where would you like to to take this in the in the future? Um, I'm actually thinking of like a shift. So I want to focus less on like raunchy humor and more of like sit down talk kind of videos. I have an amazing like bunch of people that follow me, but I also have a small percentage that are very close off to that side of me and I, I don't really give a f- sorry I'm allowed to swear yeah. Yeah, I don't really give a f- cause like I, I present myself as who I am but I think some of my audience they, I think because of their age and everything they're not comfortable with that um, but I would say that I'm very blessed and I'm very grateful to have like my followers they are very loving and they are very supportive like even my ads when most people will hate a content creator doing ads my 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 followers like would support me and and love me for it then in the shopee ad i was in they were like commenting my name and like oh my god so proud of you everything Aww. like it really made me feel like yeah i i love this I, I really like love them a lot and in a way i want to give back to them by sharing parts of myself that's not very cute in a way because i feel that i know that this generation if there's one thing i want to impart into the younger generation is to do what they want to, not cause they feel like it, but because, no, do what they do because they want to do it, not cause they feel they need to. Yeah. Yeah, like, don't feel the need to suppress yourself or suppress. I want them to be their own creator of their own life. And I know it's possible because um, I didn't grow up privileged. I didn't grow up financially privileged. I didn't grow up with a good family and everything. And people may argue and say, that, oh, because you're the odd one out, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what makes you think you are not the odd one out too? Like, what makes you think you're not the odd one out? What makes you think you're not the one that will change your family struggles? What makes you think you're not be the gen- you will not be the one that breaks your generation traumas? Yeah, because they took that step. They had that. Be- they got rid of the limiting belief that you can't be the next big thing. You think you think Ariana Grande really sits in a room before she got famous and tell herself that she can never be big, or like I don't know Taylor Swift told herself that she would never she would always be a country singer and she would 
not be big. Yeah. Because they believe that they could be the next one. And why can't you? Yeah. That you, I mean, you may not be a singer or actor, but why can't you be good at what you think you can be good at? Mm. Yeah. yeah. But if you never try, you never know. Totally. You can manifest whatever. Manifest exactly. you anything. Can. Really. You can manifest. That's why you have to change your self-concept first, which is why I keep bringing back the self-concept. Because it's one thing to tell, tell myself that I want to pursue this, right? But if my self-concept tells myself that I don't deserve it, yeah. I'll be turning away opportunities. Even if an, an, someone sends an email to me like, oh, do you want to try this new thing? You tell yourself like, oh, but I'm not ready for it. It's like giving voice to different parts of you. Oh, yeah. Because it's, I mean, to some people, maybe be, being a Beyonce is backup dancer, like never in their lifetime, but it's because they don't, you know, have this connection of dance. But Kevin, you're different. So it's almost like, even though there's a part of you that maybe there's this sense of, you know, inadequacy or, you know, I'm not sure. But then there is another part of you that you choose to feed into it. This part that loves dance, this part that uses dance as a way to, you know, express yourself, yeah. mm. to really live out this different part of your life. And then it's this part that you are really choosing to manifest, to feed, and it, it's going to grow. Because I, I wonder, have the two of you heard of this term neuroplasticity before? Oh, yeah. A little bit, a little bit. Can you tell us more? I, I think this, this term really brings hope to, to people who have really undergone maybe traumatic experiences growing up. Because when they talk about trauma as changing the brain fundamentally yeah. like some of the you know the different connections that's like how you how you make decisions how you uh regulate your emotions but the positive thing is that as we grow the brain can continually learn mm. and rewire Definitely. So, yeah. so when we start to develop another part of us and like kevin feed into that part really build up a whole sense of self the brain can start to change the wirings that your history actually mm -hmm. started. So having a brand new brain. Definitely. Yeah. After a while, Definitely. isn't it? Yeah. It's a journey, but then I, I see the wiring starting <laughs> already. Yeah. Yeah. And your brain I feel that um, it's incredibly important to surround yourself with people that will encourage that too. I feel that the moment I changed my perspective of who I want to surround myself with, the universe just brought me people that aligned with it. Like, um, I recently had a shift in like my social circle from people who were very uh, not very aligned with my beliefs and morals and when I'm around them a lot of my traumas and anxiety will be reinforced to a group now that I really enjoy hanging out with because I feel that our morals and beliefs even though they are also traumatized they also need healing they want to put in effort to heal they do not indulge in self-pity and that's something that I live by so if you're someone that wants to heal your traumas you need to surround yourself with people that are going to encourage that behavior. You can't mm. be surrounding yourself with people that are indulging in toxicity and then being like, okay, it's okay to not be okay everything. I mean, sure, it's okay to not be okay, but how long more till you, you crumble because of that? It's almost like you need a time frame, right? Like, okay, look, I mean, if you want to be sad and um, let this situation um, be in your brain for a little bit, you, you, it's good to have a time frame and go like, okay, after this, I'm going to stop crying about it. I'm going to get my butt out there. I'm going to do things. I'm going to you know, try and make life happen for, yeah. for, for yourself, yeah. right? That was a really insightful and revealing and yet fun episode. Thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us. Thank you for having for me. Sharing. I feel like I learned a lot today. Mm. Just from, not just from her, but just from sharing my experience. I feel like I learned more about myself too. Absolutely. Yeah, and thanks for like creating this like safe space where I can share it. <laughs> Aww. Thank yeah. you. And thank you, Melissa, as well, for joining us today. Thank you for thank having you. me. Yeah. It's an honor. No, it's an honor to hear from you. Thank you. Till yeah. the next episode, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. Bye. I'm honestly still kind of digesting everything that has happened, especially last week. Like, I mean, I was just talking to my sister yesterday and we we're just talking about like how it all started. We just had the 2015 SEA Games, yeah. right? And like now look at where I am and then yeah. we just looked at each other like,